Welcome everyone. Uh, we're gonna get started today. So this is our session, Belonging in DC, Special Interests and Community Formation. Uh, communities are constantly forming and growing as individuals with unique perspectives, interests, and backgrounds assemble and share their experiences. This panel today is going to assess the intriguing case studies of three such communities in the DC area. Today, we will be hearing from uh, Ken Avis, Jose Gutierrez, and, uh, well, hold on. Pamela, <laughs> Pamela Lawton. Sorry about that. Uh, we're going to start today with Ken Avis. Um, Ken is a musician, music filmmaker, presenter, and radio host. He has been presenting a series of talks at the Smithsonian and George Mason Music City, DC, which explore the history of popular mu music in DC from 1800 to the current day. Today, he talks about the time when DC was known as the nation's capital of country music, uh, the Nashville of the North. So I would like to uh, welcome Ken and uh, come on up. Thank you. What a beautiful day to be here and to visit this, this library. I've got to find a way now to pull up my presentation, which I'm sure it's gonna work perfectly. And this, yeah, we're there, we we'll get in there. just taking a second or two to warm up. It's funny, as I arrived this morning, um, the, I was getting in the elevator and somebody said, are you attending the conference? And I said, yeah, they said, are you a presenter? I said, yeah, I'm gonna talk about when Washington DC was known as the country music capital of the nation. And they said, really? I never knew that. Well, not many people do. This talk comes from those 12 week series of talks I've been doing at the Smithsonian and George Mason which cover everything, the things that you've heard about in DC. And as you walk in today, you see the exhibitions out there about punk music in DC, about go-go. We all know that DC is a jazz town and there's been lots of uh, fabulous jazz here forever. Uh, what many people don't know about is the country music. Ah, we've got it, great, or have we? And uh, in the 1950s, there's the missing part of the picture and that's what happened with hillbilly music because all of the jazz, uh, background of DC emerged from a massive wave of migration after the Civil War, particularly with African Americans coming to DC because it was a place of hope with all kinds of possibilities. The Howard University was here, the Howard Hospital, the Freedmen's Hospital, uh, the first high school for African Americans was here. There was a community here, there were jobs here. So this was a place of hope and a, a wave of migration came in and provided those people who built the community around things like U Street, uh, the Black Broadway in the 1920s and 30s, because music is always like a community builder for people all over the world. A second wave of migration came along in the 1940s and it, there was a push and a pull. The push was the depression in the 30s. And so people living out in rural Virginia, Maryland, North Carolina, South Carolina, Atlanta, uh, had no income and they had to find jobs and DC was a place which during wartime had a great war. There were no bombs falling on DC. It wasn't like Liverpool or London. Um, it was a great place for diplomats to come. It was a great place to center the US war effort. And there was a massive influx of people to the DC area. Those people included 200,000 mainly single young women coming in from all over America. They were called the Lipstick Brigade. And they were the people who were the administrators of the war effort. They were working in tents on the Washington Mall and there was nowhere for them to live. You know, the, the overcrowding in what was already an overcrowded city was becoming quite incredible. And then the other group who came in were the rural workers, the farm workers uh, from all of those areas I've mentioned, who were here to build the Pentagon. The biggest building site in America in the 1940s was the Pentagon and to build the office buildings that we see all around DC right now and to work in those buildings. So this massive influx of people. And that's where the story begins with this second wave of migration in the 1940s. Because what was different about this migration was it was rural and it was significantly white, not entirely white, but significantly white. And when those people came, they came here with their fiddles and banjos, uh, as you would expect. And this is where the story begins. Here's our hero of the story. This is Connie Bigay. Ah, some recognition, great. So Connie Bigay actually came from Lizard Lick, North Carolina. 
He was born into a small farming family, had a tiny family. They could barely survive there. He was one of the rural poor and he decided farming was not gonna be his life. So he became a soil scientist and came to Washington DC in 1942 to work for the government. In the meantime, he also was a knife salesman on the streets of North Carolina as well, by the way. So he got a little bit of entrepreneurial skill to get him through college. And that comes to, to bear fruits when he arrived in DC. So here he is in a government building at a microphone as a broadcaster for the government doing a program called Home and Farm. He talked about soil, he talked about uh, the weather, and he would play this hillbilly music. And I deliberately use the word hillbilly music because that's what it was called in those days, the music from the rural states of America. Within just a few years, he changed. This was Connie B. Gay, a photograph from the Country Music Hall of Fame. And within 15 years, he really deserved his position there in the Country Music Hall of Fame uh, because of the things that he achieved during that period of time. He was an entrepreneur and he went to a brand new radio station opening up in Arlington. If you know Arlington, it's by George Mason and Lee Highway, now called Langston Boulevard, you'll see a massive tower. And that was the radio tower of WARL Radio. And he approached the brand new radio station there and said, I would love to do a program on your radio station because there are a lot of people like me and they've come to this town and all they ever hear on the radio is jazz and it's not our music. And he said, I would like to do this program where I play hillbilly music. And I'll also talk about the weather and talk about farming a little bit as well, because that's what we're interested in. So again, straight away saying, let's build some community here and some, some community of interest from this influx of people. The people who were coming in initially where they moved to was Anacostia. And something like 80% of the housing of Anacostia was built between 1940 and 1960. In 1960, Anacostia was 98% white. And it was because of all of these people coming in from the rural south, uh, looking for places to work and the building of these houses there. So they were close to Navy yards, they were close to the Pentagon and everything. The other place where the people moved to was the suburbs, Prince George's County, and Arlington and Alexandria. Arlington trebled in size between 1940 and 1960. It had been a rural community before that pretty much. But in this period of time, with this massive influx of people and suburbanization, roads, rail, and so on, it became a center for these people. So you've got these concentrations of migrants coming into town, listening to hillbilly music or looking for hillbilly music. So when Connie B. Gay started his radio program, it was instant success. He was doing it five days a week and his deal with Arlington Radio was, you don't have to pay me. Let me have the radio station. I'll go out and look for sponsors because he knew he could sell knives to anybody. So, you know, wh what's the problem with this? He was getting 2 million listeners a day to his radio station in 1946 when he, when he opened the program and he called the program Town and Country. He said, you know, I live in the town like everybody else. I'm from the country like everybody else. And where the big success was, was getting this hillbilly music play in all the time. And people were tuning in more and more and more. So the program expanded. It started off as two hours. It became three hours, eventually five hours, three separate programs on a Saturday as well. Uh, the demand was absolutely incredible. So he had this success in radio. It was so appealing to listen to his program that he managed to syndicate the town and country program to 18,000 radio stations in the United States. I didn't even know there were that many radio stations, but apparently in the 1940s and 50s there were. He was making so much money through the syndication and the sponsorship ads that he actually bought 50 radio stations as well. And these are two of the stations. I just wanted to show you these. One of them is WGAY station. It's out in Maryland. And uh, he didn't name it WGAY. He said, I bought it just to satisfy my ego because it was already called WGAY. And the second one there, the world building is still there in Silver Spring. That was the headquarters of his uh, radio empire. And the building is still there. That was a photograph taken in 1964. If radio was lucrative, it wasn't lucrative enough for Connie Begay. He wanted more. And so, 
he started to uh, become a presenter as well, uh, an impresario. And here's one of his all-star hillbilly air circuses. This took place at Bailey's Crossroads Airport uh, down there in Arlington. Um, most people in Arlington have no idea it used to be an airport, but in those days it was. And he was charging $1 a ticket and got 25,000 people into that show. So that was the kind of demand that just gives you an indication of the interest in country music. But it wasn't just in Arlington that they had that interest. This was the world's greatest hillbilly show, Gay Time, at Constitution Hall. Now, Constitution Hall was all about classical music, light opera, maybe. That was about as light as it got. And they were very resistant to Connie B. Gay putting on hillbilly music in that venue. But then they had a change of management, and the new manager said, will you fill the seats? And he goes, should do, should go well. So he put on 26 consecutive weeks of hillbilly shows in Constitution Hall and sold out every single show. Not only that, he live streamed the shows because he had the radio network. So there was no Zoom in those days, but he was able to get this live on the radio across America, again, making DC recognized as the country music capital of the nation at that stage. It wasn't just places like the Constitution Hall. He was also putting on the hillbilly shows at uh, the Uline Arena, all the sports stadium, the Griffith Stadium, all of these places and packing, absolutely packing these stadiums back to back. Not only that, he had a boat going up and down the Potomac on a Saturday night, the hillbilly cruise. 2000 people on the hillbilly cruise, $2 a tickets, wine, dine, dance and listen to hillbilly music. One of his most famous shows on the hillbilly cruise was when Colonel Parker, Elvis Presley's manager approached him and said, I have this young singer He's really good, nobody's heard of him yet, but they will. His name is Elvis Presley. Would you book him for your cruise? And Connie Begay said, sure, we'll bring him in. That's no problem. That was 1956 when he was an unknown. But between the time of the booking and the time when Elvis Presley set foot on the boat, they released the song Hound Dog. So the boat was absolutely packed. It was overfilled and the water folks wouldn't allow the boat to leave the dock. So they had to do the show tied to the dock and about a hundred people were so upset that they didn't get the cruise that night that they said we want our money back you know we were looking for a romantic cruise with our girlfriends and boyfriends here give us the money back so there's at least a hundred people from DC in those days who cannot say they saw Elvis Presley's first ever show in the Washington DC area not only that he was an expert at advertising so this is a poster for the grand opening of an Acme uh, supermarket in, in uh, Arlington. And if you look very closely, you'll see that he was selling his bands because he was also an impresario. We'll get to that soon as well. And uh, he was selling his bands. So the Jimmy Dean and his Texas Wildcats band, uh, who were based in Falls Church, by the way, um, played that show. And they also were playing at uh, car showrooms, electronics goods showrooms, all the consumer goods as an advertising ploy. That's how big country music was in Washington, D.C. in the 1950s. As if that wasn't enough, along came television in 1955. So given the success of the town and country radio show, it was a natural to go on the TV. And here's the TV crew with Jimmy Dean at the center with the accordion, originally from Texas. But as I say, now living in Falls Church, his house is still standing right by the Falls Church Metro, a little three bedroom suburban house there. And uh, he had the same kind of success here. The show got franchised to 50 urban markets, the big markets around America. And again, just like the radio show, it started off as five nights a week, and then it just multiplied. There were matinees, George Hamilton IV became one of the presenters along with Jimmy Dean, another one of uh, Connie B. Gay's uh, stable of stars. Oh, look what we've got. Do we have time for a little video? So <laughs> this is just to give you a taste of what Washington DC country music was like in 1950. This is a very rare film. It's in color. The TV program was in black and white. So it's interesting that it's in color. This was actually a promotional video that was made uh, to sell the show to sponsors. Uh, and it just appeared ab about a year ago. Let me see if I can make it work. It'd be lovely if we can get some music. You can't be talking about uh, music all the time. You've got to listen to it, but it doesn't seem happy. Um, let's see if I just click it. Well, 
welcome to Town and Country Time, the show that features the tops in country and folk music, and of course, the biggest stars. Jimmy Dean and the Texas Wildcats are on hand to provide the music, and our roster of stars includes little Mary Clink, Quincy Snodgrass, Fiddle and Buck Ryan, Pete Castle, and the Echo Inn Clocker. That's the Glen Echo Inn. And now, here's our genial master of ceremonies, Jimmy Dean. All right, and thank you so much, and to you nice people out there, a big howdy, and welcome to our show called Town and Country Time. We got a whole passel of fine entertainers here today, such as Pete Castle, Little Mary Click, Quincy Snodgrass. But before we get into that, I'd like to do one for you that I had the pleasure of putting on record. Thanks to you fine folks out there, it bought me quite a few groceries. It's a tune called Bumming Around. <laughs> I got an old out Got some over my shoulder. I'm seeing some toes tucking. Not many. So there you go. That's the other music of Washington, D.C., the hillbilly music. Um, given his success, uh, he was voted in 1957 as America's uh, King of Country Music, Man of the Year in Country Music. And in this newspaper article from the Washington Star, it actually refers to Washington, D.C. as the nation's country capital. And it talks about the $2 million a year that uh, Connie Begay was earning in the 1950s, in 1957. The Washington Post had an article about him which was titled, there's gold in them there hillbillies. Um, <laughs> so it shows his success. Um, and as a result of that success and his recognition, I mean, I mentioned his relationship with Colonel Parker. He also was asked by Colonel Parker to manage Hank Williams at one point. Um, and Hank Williams stayed in his house in Arlington, uh, but he couldn't manage him for more than a couple of months because Hank Williams had such a problem with alcoholism and it was upsetting Connie B. Gay's family. He was actually offered a 50% share in Elvis Presley, but he said, no, I can't do that. I've got too many artists on my books at the moment. My roster's too rich. So he was the man who turned down Elvis Presley. But he was recognized in the Country Music Hall of Fame, partly because he was the first ever president of the Country Music Association of America. He was elected to the Country Music Association in 1959 when it was founded. And uh, people just recognize that he was the guy who could build this hillbilly music up. One other thing I haven't mentioned, Country Music Hall of Fame. How come we're calling it the Country Music Hall of Fame when it's been hillbilly music all of this time? Connie Begay in Arlington, W-A-R-L, used to say, well, let's play a little bit of music from the country. And eventually that became, let's play a little bit of country music. And Connie Begay is actually considered to be the man who invented the term country music. It happened here in Washington, D.C. Hard to believe, but true. So Connie Begay sold up his interests in the 1960s. Uh, he he'd bought a club amongst these many things. He bought a, a club um, in D.C. and opened it as a hillbilly music club. And he got so much of a hassle from the Washington, D.C. police and issues about underage drinking and fights at the club and so on. There were about 2,000 hillbilly clubs playing live hillbilly music, by the way, in the DC area in the late 1950s. And uh, it actually drove Connie B. Gay to drink as well. So faced with divorce and alcoholism, he decided to pack up his business and move to the British Virgin Isles, which he did. And then he returned to Nashville, where he had a lot of contacts when he wanted to get back into business and eventually to uh, the Washington DC area again. He's buried in Fairfax County, uh, just down near Falls Church to this day. The other things that he created during that time, he had such a entrepreneurial bent that he found a lot of the big stars of country music who lived in and around this area. So Patsy Cline was a vocalist who he found. She lived in Warrington, Virginia, and he created the Warrington Country Music Festival where he spotted her in the country music vocal competition and he instantly uh, signed her to a contract to be the vocalist for our friend Jimmy Dean there uh, and the Texas Wildcats. So they played together uh, for many years. And uh, Jimmy Dean himself went on to incredible success as the face of country music when Connie Begay sold his rights to Jimmy Dean to CB, 
S television in 1959 to create the Jimmy Dean country music television show. There was a falling out between Connie Begay and Jimmy Dean because Connie sold the rights to CBS uh, for $1,000 a week pay for Jimmy Dean. That's what he was earning in those days. Jimmy Dean subsequently found out that Connie Begay was getting another $1,000 a week for himself as part of that contract deal, and they fell out over that. He felt really he should have maybe had one and a half thousand and, you know, a little bit less for, uh, for Connie. How are we doing on time? One minute. Just very briefly, then, I'm going to scoot through a whole bunch of slides here. Connie wasn't the only thing in time. The Stoneman family came here from Galax, Virginia, playing bluegrass music. Pops Stoneman, called Pops because he had 23 children, 13 of whom survived. And those 13 children uh, became the Little Pebbles, Pops Stoneman and the Little Pebbles. The photograph there sitting on the porch is a house that Pops Stoneman built from lumber he'd uh, borrowed from the Navy Yards where he was working. And he built that house in Prince George's County at Friendship Heights. Um, and on that porch, many of the greats of DC's bluegrass scene, because it then became the bluegrass capital, many of those people went and played with the Stonemans and learned their craft playing with the Stonemans. Um, I'm so tempted, but I won't do it. We won't show you that one. The Stonemans too went on to incredible country music fame and, and eventually moved to uh, Nashville as people did because while DC was considered the Nashville of the North, something happened in 1960 when Chet Atkins opened the first ever recording studio in Nashville and created the Nashville sound. And all of a sudden the business moved there. But until that time, the only thing Nashville had was a big thing, but the only thing they had was the Grand Ole Opry, the Ryman uh, Auditorium there. And so quite for good reason, DC was known as the nation's country music capital because all of the business was here, the radio was here, the TV was here, the musicians were here. And for one of the films that we made, Anacostia Delta, we interviewed Vince Gill about five years ago. And he said as much himself, he said, you know, all the great musicians in Nashville, most of them came from the DC area in those days because this is where the action was. The legacy has continued with bluegrass, the country gentleman, the seldom seen, there were other musics running in parallel, which were Roots Americana music. We have Elizabeth Cotton, who was down in Alexandria, who wrote the song Freight Train when she was 12 years of age. And 50 years later, it became an international hit. Skip James and Mississippi John Hurt lived in Arlington, uh, playing country blues during the 1960s. So many videos I could show you. And the tradition continued. Roy Buchanan there, one of the greatest guitar players, the Telemaster, uh, lived in Arlandria and then eventually Fairfax County. Emmylou Harris uh, was in Bethesda where she followed the seldom scene as the host of a weekly um, open mic night there. Mary Chapin Carpenter, five Grammy, country Grammy awards. Uh, Bill Kirshen, and we've got as well some venues here still. It struck me the other day that we have uh, Hank Deetles up in Maryland. We have JVs uh, in uh, Falls Church, still playing seven nights a week, playing this kind of honky-tonk blues music. We've probably got as many country music venues doing seven nights a week as we have jazz venues in DC at the moment, sadly enough, but uh, a living tradition and people still remember the music that came through this area. Uh, God, I'll be finished now. My apologies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ken. All right, so our next presenter today is Jose Gutierrez. He holds a bachelor's degree in psychology from the university's, uh, University Ana G. Mendez in Washington, DC. He is a local and national longtime human rights and social justice activist and immigration advocate, uh, Latinx LGBTQ historian, artist, writer, and poet. He is the founder of the Jose Gutierrez Archives, the Latino GLBT History Project, the DC Latino Pride and co-founder of the Rainbow History Project. In 2015, he contributed to the book Queer Brown Voices with an interview and essay titled, We Must Preserve Our Latino LGBTQ History. Jose works with the DC government DHS and currently is writing a book about the history of Washington DC's Latinx LGBTQ community. Welcome, Jose. Thank you, thank, thank you Lena, and thank you everybody for the support. 
Um, I also want to thank uh, to the DC uh, History Center for this opportunity. And thank you also to uh, the Latinx Advisory Group uh, that support me in this presentation. My name is uh, Jose Gutierrez and I'm a local activist, historian, poet, and writer. And I'm very happy to be here. Um, I'm going to talk, uh, before I start, I'm, I'm going to just mention a few things. One, I'm going to talk only partially about the history of the DC Latinx LGBTQ community. This is a little bit of our history. I'm also going to use sometimes Latinx or Latino or Hispanic or Latini, but uh, we mean the Latino community. Um, I'm, a, I'm going also to uh, mention that uh, probably like uh, uh, 15 years ago, I make 11 uh, uh, interviews with seniors, uh, Latinas, LGBTQ, which I get information to do part of my presentation. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you for your support. <clears throat> Um, a few years ago, I born and raised in Mexico, but uh, my family, we moved, we crossed, we crossed the border to Atlanta, Georgia. And then in 1993, I came to Washington DC for the National March. In that time, I was looking for information about uh, our history and I can't find anything. So I get this book, uh, it's called The Latino Experience History. And uh, it's a great book but it's nothing about the queer community, queer Latino community. So I was really frustrated for that. And then I get this book called Gay and Lesbian Washington DC, um, which I buy the book, I went to the opening reception and in any of the pages there mention anything about Latino LGBTQ or queers Latinos. So I was really frustrated for that. And uh, so I, I start collecting um, uh, history, brochures, photos, banners. I have a few items here. If you want after the presentation, feel free to come. Um, and um, so I start creating my project, Jose Gutierrez Archives. And uh, my goal is to educate people with my archives because I think it's not only to, to uh, preserve, but also to disseminate the, the information. So this is, uh, okay. So uh, part, part of my archives, uh, that was uh, the, the struggle to survive in this country and to be visible. And some of, the, some of the pictures, like I say, some of the community came to Washington DC in the 60s, 70s and 80s, but mostly on the 80s. And there were uh, uh, sisters and brothers from all Latin America, um, Colombia, Mexico, El Salvador, and the Caribbean, and also from different cities in the country uh, that they moved to Washington DC for different reasons, getting a better jobs, opportunities. And also because we have the embassies, the international embassies um, here uh, um, in Washington DC, but also we have a lot of Puerto Rican sisters and brothers to also move to Washington DC to work in the government or in, in different jobs. <clears throat> so, um, Today, I'm going to talk specific about uh, uh, four areas, which is the World One, World Two, World Four, and World Six. Um, especially because those are the, the World One and World Six, they were the areas in which we, um, uh, uh, we, we have the first bars and organizations in Washington, D.C. I believe the first area was uh, Eastern Market, which is the World Six. And we have the, the National Llegó, that was the first uh, Latino organization for queer uh, Latinas and Latinos. And, then, and we have a, also a bar called Aguardiente and a Banana Cafe. 
but also in war in World one we have uh which is adams morgan and man Plazan. we have el faro which was the first uh latino queer bar noa noa salud churreria madrid uh club fuego and the house of leti and root which they were uh, organizing activities and la clinica del pueblo and also i'm going to talk a little bit about the pond circle the, in World Two, and also uh, Georgia Avenue in World Four. Okay, so um, on, on the beginning, uh, uh, many uh, Latinas and Latinos, they were organizing private parties in, in the houses of people. And then we have the first bar called El Faro, the lighthouse, which was in, from 1990 to 1999. And, Right now it's a restaurant. Can you see that that is like a like a restaurant? But the bar was on the second floor. If you see the flag, um, that was the that was the bar El Faro, and um, the first transgenders Latinas that they were uh, performing was Fiorella Bandorfino, Norma Duval, La Bomba, and Sofia Carrero. Okay, another one uh, bar that we have in Adams Morgan was uh, El Noa Noa, which was from 1998 to 2015. Right now, the bar is an Irish bar, but in that time, in, the, in that time, that was that was like a regular bar. And then the picture in the, on the middle is um, they have an alley uh, by Columbia Road. So you can go either in the front to on the back. And the owner of the bar was Gladys Fernandez, uh, the lady on the right with white uh, t-shirt. And that was on the bottom, one of the flyers that we have for one activity. <clears throat> okay, this is about uh, Eastern Market, the War Six. So, um, the first picture is uh, for uh, Banana Cafe. Banana Cafe was uh, a restaurant and was a bar in Eastern Market. And the owner was uh, my friend, uh, my Cuban friend, uh, Jorge Zamorano, Jorge Garcia Zamorano. And then Llegó, which was the first uh, national organization, the first office that was in Eastern Market in um, 703 G Street which is right now a part of the Eastern market. And then we have a, a, a Latino bar called Aguardiente, which is on the last uh, flyer. Um, so in World Two, we have the second bar called Escándalo. Escándalo was in P Street, uh, P in, I believe 21st or 22nd. And Escándalo was a community, community uh, Latino center. And um, we have many performances there. We create the Latino float and uh, Roberto Hermosilla, which is on the corner. He was the owner. And also he's the same person in drug show and also as, as a person. And uh, Roberto and Jaime, they were like operating the, the bar. Um, the bar support uh, our uh, Latinx community for many years. <clears throat> so uh, the, another bar that we have in the city, I, I believe is the third bar was Chaos, which was located in DuPont Circle on the corner of 17th Street and Q Street. And um, Bar Chaos, they have different nights and uh, they have a contest, they have performance. And three of the uh, drag queens, that was uh, Marilyn Suley, and then in the middle, uh, that was Victoria Armani, and then Gigi Couture. Um, the bar uh, was our third bar in the city. And like I mentioned before, they have one night uh, for Latino lesbians, and they have another night for, for gay men and per for performance. Okay, so, <clears throat> 1987 was a very important year for our queer community in general. For the Latino community, that was extremely important that year, 1987. Why? Because we have many events during that year. The main event 
that we have in Washington DC was uh, the National March. Uh, the National March uh, on Washington for lesbian and gays. That was in 1987. Uh, Cesar Chavez was one of the speakers uh, uh, in the march. Uh, he was not gay, but he was uh, supporting, supporting the march. And if you see on the left side is Cesar Chavez with Nicole Murray Ramirez. And um, the same year, we have uh, one Latino organization nonprofit, 501c3, called Salud Inc. That was uh, organized in July, 1987. And if you see the second uh, picture, is, this is one of the contests that they create. Now, the other event that we have in Washington DC during the same year was uh, Enlace. Enlace means uh, link, link. So Enlace was the first uh, local group that we have in Washington DC. And um, Enlace also was created in 1987. Um, and then on the right side, the last, the last slide is the National Llegó. National Llegó was the first national organization, queer, queer Latin organization. So 1987 was a very important uh, year, not, so, not only for Latinas and Latinos, but for uh, all our community in Washington, DC. So uh, like I mentioned before, we have the first local groups in, in DC. We have Enlace, who was created in 1987 to 1994. And um, a group of uh, friends and activists, they create uh, that group. The second local group that we have in the city was called Gelam, or Gente Latina de Ambiente. And that, that was created in 1994 to 1999. And the third one that we have in the city was called Platiquemos. And Platiquemos was created by my friend, uh, Fausto Fernandez. Uh, uh, he passed away recently, but uh, those are only three examples of the groups. And I mentioned this because uh, our Latinx community, we have the tendency to create a group and then working for a few years and then the group disappear. And then they create another group and, and we talk about the same issues, immigration issues, uh, uh, health issues, uh, partnership issues, but for some reason, we don't have the continuity. <clears throat> this, is, this is a slice of the first transgenders uh, that we have in the city in the late 80s. Um, it's Fiorella Vandorfino from El Salvador, Sofia Carrero from Nicaragua, Bella Evangelista, the third one, she was, she was killed in DC for a hate, hate crime. She was from Guatemala. And then on the, on the end, we have a Cherry Van Crawford. Uh, she was from, uh, she's Mexican American. And then La Frenchie, she's Peruvian from Peru. Xavier Blumendel, she's from here. Uh, Gabriela Montes and Ignacio. Uh, so, th th but they were the first one who started in the 80s, in the late, the, the late 80s, beginning of the 90s. <clears throat> so as soon as we have some uh, movement on the beginning of the 90s, uh, 1992 or 1994, they start creating this kind of contest, uh, uh, Miss, Miss Gay Latina, Miss Gay Latina uh, uh, Universal. This is only two examples that we have in the city. We have the Miss Gay Hispanic that was from 1992 to 2004, and that was created from Salud Inc. And the other example is Miss Gay, Miss Gay Mexico, which was from 1994 to 2009 and was organized by Ignacio Aguirre. But we have in the, in the city probably like five contests. So, but I want to give you just two examples for this presentation. <clears throat> and, during, during our uh, Latinx community, we have different, um, uh, different like uh, uh, activities or events that we have. One of the events, the first events that we have is the religion events. 
we have in the city two or three people who's working with uh, spirituality or religious events. Uh, Metropolitan Community Church, MCC, uh, create Unidos. Unidos was a group of Latinas and Latinos queers, and that was organized in MCC uh, uh, by Reverend Jorge Delgado, Reverend Dwayne, Dwayne Johnson, and Reverend Kathy Alexander. And we also have uh, the leather component uh, that we were uh, meeting at, at the DC Center uh, in 2016. Okay, and that, that is another group that, that I started 20 years ago, the Latino History Project. And um, we create many events, including presentations at the Washington Historical Society which now is the DC History Center. And if you see this picture, I believe that was probably in 2008, but I want to thank you, the, the DC Center, DC History Center, because they allowed me to create probably like three exhibits, 208, 209, and 210. Um, thank you, Karen, and, and, and thank you. Um, <clears throat> So uh, this is another example. This is Casa Ruby. Uh, Ruby Corrado created uh, one organization in Georgia Avenue, which is helping uh, transgender of color or brown uh, uh, transgenders and Latinas uh, transgenders in 2014. And on the right side is Lula Lambda, which this is uh, most like political and that was created by Jesse Garcia. And LULAC Lambda is a chapter of LULAC, a big organization for Latinas and Latinos. But they, they, they do a lot of activities in the city. Um, so Queer Brown Voices was a book in which I participate with another 14 activists and the 14 uh, um, uh, stories that were really nice. Uh, uh, so we present this in Bass Boys and Poets, so on February 8, 2016. And we also have another important component of our community, which I think we need to work more on that, which is our Afro Latinx uh, LGBTQ or Afro Latinx queer community. Um, the DC Center organized in 2009 an event called Afro Latinx Voices. Escuchanos, which uh, some members of our community participate, and that was great. So uh, the event was organized by the DC Center. Um, thank you very much. And I want, uh, be, before I move on, um, I just want to say one thing. I want to just to mention one thing about. Uh, about the hate crimes that we have in the city, we have different hate crimes uh, to our LGBTQ community. And the first one that we have, that was about a uh, Latina lesbian from Guatemala. She was, she was killed outside El Faro. That was in Adams Morgan in 1992, 1993. We have the, the second hate crime that was uh, about a Bella Evangelista which she was a transgender and she was also from Guatemala, Guatemalan American, and she was performing an escándalo and uh, she was uh, also uh, killed in World War. And I, I also want to mention about this. This is about uh, the murders in Orlando, Florida, in which probably 40 something Latinas 49. and Latinos. 49. 49, they were killed. Most of them, they were from Puerto Rico. But the reason that I bring this is because they have a lot of connections with Washington, D.C. And yeah, that was really sad. And uh, this is a picture of me with uh, Dolores Huerta. Dolores Huerta is one of the powerful uh, Latinas in the country that she fight with uh, Cesar Chavez uh, in, in California, and uh, uh, Dolores Huerta is supporting the, the LGBTQ community. Um, just to, in conclusion, 
uh, <clears throat> in conclusion, I think it's very important to preserve our history. So if you have archives in your home, just keep it, uh, use it uh, as it's free material, or you can donate it. If you have uh, uh, materials that you, you want to donate, please contact the DC History Center or contact somebody from any museum. Um, and uh, so my, right now I just finished my website is uh, www.josegutierrezarchives. So please check it out when you have any chance. And I'm, I'm in the process also to writing a book about our history. And I'm also working uh, actively with the Latinx uh, advisory group. Uh, thank you, thank you to the DC History Center for this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, a little frozen right now. Maybe it'll come back in a second. I would like to introduce our final panelist today, uh, Pamela Watton. She is the Florence Gaskins Harper uh, Endowed Chair in Art Education and thought leader for the Hurwitz Center at Maryland Institute College of Art. A fifth generation educator from Washington, DC. She earned a BA degree in studio art and sociology at the University of Virginia, an MFA in printmaking from Howard University and an ed DCTA doctor of education in the College of Teaching of Art from Teachers College of Columbia University. Lawton's scholarly research and teaching revolves around visual narrative and intergenerational arts learning in the BIPOC community settings. Her artwork is grounded in social practice, seeking to illuminate contemporary issues, cultural traditions, and the stories of people impacted by them. Her honors include the Pearl Greenberg Award for Teaching and Research in Art Education, the Fulbright Distinguished Chair at University of Edinburgh, the Assistant Associate Artist at Tate Exchange in London, and local and international artist residencies. In addition, in addition to co-authoring the book, Community-Based Art Education Across the Lifespan, Finding Common Ground, she has numerous journal and book chapter publications, uh, presentations, and exhibitions. Her artworks can be found at the National Museum of Women in the Arts, the Tate Britain Library, the Institute for Advanced Studies in the Humanities, University of Edinburgh, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University Cabal Library Special Collection in Artist Books, and the College of Health and Human Services at the University of North Carolina. Uh, thank you so much, Pamela, and welcome up here. I'm going to try and get this Ooh, working again. Hopefully after all that, the PowerPoint is working. <laughs> so basically, my presentation is about um, the history and analysis of Discover Graphics, a defunct museum, school, and community partnership that was uh, developed through the Smithsonian American Art Museum, which was not called that at the time. It's had several name changes. And it provided for 24 years professional level printmaking studio experiences for high school students in the DC metropolitan region. And I was one of the very fortunate recipients to take part in that program. Um, so, and, and thinking about this, I wanted to, to kind of think about what made it unique and critical and transformative. How did it benefit not only the students, but the community and the museum and what, how did it influence the lives of the young people who actually went through the program? So those were the research questions that I was looking at. And the method that I used was basically, I went down to the Smithsonian um, archives on Maryland, I think it's on Maryland Avenue in Southwest. And this was just before the pandemic closed everything. So I had gotten this opportunity to write a book chapter about this project, which I'll give you the QR code for if you're interested in reading the, the details. But I just happened to be on my spring break and I went down to the archives and they pulled out 10 years worth of material from 1971 to 1981 for me. And I had like a week to go through it. And I never got to the, the latter half of the program because boom, they cut everything down. So I was like, okay, great, what do I do now? And so I did wind up, uh, luckily, um, bumping into three people. One right here, this woman here, Teresa Grana, actually was the person who pretty much took the program from its very beginnings right up through the, the, the most, uh, at least 15 years of it. And had a nice conversation with Teresa. And I also talked with two other people who taught in the program. So that then became sort of like a, a Zoom interview sort of thing to get the last years of the program's information. Um, so in thinking about this, um, the conceptual framework I used was one of critical race theory, a critical race theory lens, 
um, to think about the transformative effect it had on me as a, a young black uh, person in Washington DC studying art and the, ex uh, the experiences that it gave me that I did not have in DC public schools. Um, so viewing it through that lens, CRT exposes the centrality of race and racism in the arts and reveals how the dynamics of race and racial oppression manifest both explicitly and implicitly through assumptions, practices, and frameworks that define art and art education as a field. So it was a useful method for me to think about the intersectional ways that race, class, and gender can inform historical research. So um, CRT kind of developed in the early 1970s, which coincided with the Black Power movement here, the Black Arts movement, and all of these things were gaining traction around the same time that I was a young student. Um, so the unspoken intent of the Discover Graphics program was really to provide Black students in particular with opportunities to visit the museum, learn more uh, about art mediums that they would not normally have access to in schools because then public schools did not have printing presses in them. You couldn't do etching or lithography or any of these things in a public school, or at least not in a DC public school. Um, and it was an effort to interest more teachers and students in printmaking as a medium. So the first organ, uh, graphics exhibition was organized by the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. And it was specifically for Washington DC public high school students. And the first place winner for this first um, exhibition, which I think was in 1969, uh, was Thomasine Michener, who you see pictured here with Teresa Grana, who was her art teacher at the time at Eastern High School. So Teresa was an art teacher at the time that this happened. Um, in the meantime, we have Jane Farmer, who is a former art teacher, and she is the staff associate at the Smithsonian American Art Museum for secondary education in the museum. And she sort of was the person who conceived of this idea for Discover Graphics um, with help and, um, from the Washington Print Club, who was also very interested in having young people learn more about printmaking. And so she sponsored at the museum um, Printmaking Day in 1971. And what she wound up doing was getting um, uh, artists, printmakers from the area, from the DC area to do these demonstrations of all four printmaking processes. So they had etching, um, silk screen, I think, relief. I'm not sure if they had lithography um, at that particular thing. I don't think so. But so she had, I want to tell you, over 600 students came to this printmaking day. So some of these are pictures that you can see. I don't know if they're from that exact printmaking day, but these are pictures that I got from the Smithsonian archives. So uh, you can see some of the processes and the room is packed. So people are, you know, wanting to get involved, know what this is. There's a press, you see all the people around the press looking to see what's going on with it. And so because of that success, Farmer then contacted Charles Brand, who made a printmaking press. Um, and they were headquartered in New York City. And he asked them about donating presses to the Smithsonian for this program that she had in mind. And they very generously did so. So they donated um, seven presses, I think in all, both intaglio and lithography presses. So I wanna say that the museum's location was very strategic. If you walk out of this library, you will see the museum catty corner to you right where the gallery place Metro is. That is where this program took place. So if you're thinking about what the map might have looked like, um, there, number seven there is actually the museum, right? And then right across number two is where we are. And at the same time, this was going on. So we're talking about like the really early 70s, 69, 70, 71, um, Federal City Community College also gets its start. And the minute they open their doors, they have so many people who want to attend that they really don't have space for all of them. But most of those students were African-American and they were interested in the arts and visual art and music. And the building did not really have the facilities for all the arts processes that people might've wanted to learn. So thinking about the museum being right there and wanting to start this printmaking program, you can see a, a great synergy happening there. Um, so the library opened in 72. 
FCC opened in 68, and this program actually got its start in 1972. So what is it exactly? So she convinced, uh, and I think probably part of this was a great part due to Director Taylor, who was the director of the museum, who was highly supportive of this program. Um, but she got these presses from Charles Brand, and they actually created a space in the museum to put this professional printmaking studio. So this picture is actually from the like 1977, which was when, when I was in the program. But this is what the studio looked like. So you can see the presses. They're on the wall. You see explanations of the various processes. And so they hired, um, they began the program by hiring John Sirica. I think that's how he pronounces his name. And he was a local studio artist, a printmaker who had a studio here in DC. And so the idea was for him to train students from FCC to then train the art teachers in DC public schools, right? Who would then, you know, create this program. So start this Discover Graphics program. So John spent 12 weeks in his studio training 11 art majors from FCC in the intaglio process, which is like etching. And the college students assisted him in teaching 10 art teachers. Um, and then 10 high school students. So the whole total participants was 110 for this first effort. So they met for four weekday mornings for over four weeks in the museum then, in the printmaking studio. And the end result was an exhibition of the high school college students prints at the museum. And that provided even more public exposure for the program and to encourage people to want to engage in printmaking and learn about it. So utilizing the resources of the museum High school students and their teachers were provided with in-depth studio museum experiences. Um, so things like, for example, they had the print collection there. Students would spend some time with the docents walking through the print collection, talking about the prints and looking at what an etching looks like and talking about the differences in the types of prints. And then they would go into the studio and make their own work. So um, let me go back one. What you see here, um, Alan Kaneshiro um, taught in the program, I guess for about, I think about 10, not 10, maybe, yeah, about 10 years, I think. So he was the, the lead um, instructor, but it was so many people coming through the program that he needed assistance. So he did have an assistant, one of whom I talked to, which Georgia Deal was a longtime printmaker in this area, and she's now in uh, the Asheville area. So here you see John working with art teachers. So part of this was to train the art teachers on the process so that they could then select students to participate in the program. And then here you see Teresa Grana who came in right after Jane Farmer left. Like so Jane was doing this for I think about a year. And then Teresa came in and you can see her working with um, students from my high school because that's one of my art teachers there, Patricia Giles over on the, the right and some of the students from H.D. Woodson High School, which is where I went to school, uh, talking about prints in the museum's collection. So Discover Graphics took place in six four-week cycles each school year. All DC area secondary schools were eligible to apply to the program. And between 12 to 15 students were chosen per school that participated to be at the museum workshop. Students spent one full school day each week of the cycle in the museum studio. Now, the second component of this, think about how complex this is now. The second component of this provided a traveling press program. So here you can see Georgia Deal with workers from the Smithsonian loading up a press and about $2,000 worth of additional material like paper, ink, and the other supplies that you need to make a print onto these trucks to go to four schools per cycle. So if you were lucky enough to get selected as a student to go to the museum program, that was fantastic. But if you didn't get selected for that and your school got selected for a press, your teacher had been trained to use that. And if they needed help, there was a college student who'd been trained to help them with the press. And you got to keep this press for about a month and you know use it with the other students who didn't get to go to the museum. So um, that was a pretty, I think, pretty expensive proposition too, but, um, and it was all free. There was no cost to anyone. So here you see, I'm now gonna get into my experience. So 
I first was introduced to it as in the in-school program in the 10th grade, the traveling press had come to my high school and I wound up creating an etching, like an etching self-portrait. I wish I could say I still have it. My art teacher kept all those things forever. I still am in touch with him, um, but I don't have it. He had it. I'm not sure what happened with it, but I took part in that program. And so I kind of fell in love with the process. And then by the time I was in the 12th grade, I was selected for the museum program. And that's where I learned how to do lithography. So at this point, I learned stone lithography and um, metal plate etching. And part of that, as I said, was to talk with um, docents and go around and look at um, the prints in the collection. You can just barely see me right there on the, the left edge of the frame in the gallery. Um, another part of this that was so transformative, I think, for students was it wasn't just learning these processes and learning about <clears throat> how museums work and prints and how, what do curators do. So all of this was a part of it. So you learned all about the museum world and what it meant to be a kind of a professional artist, what a professional printmaker does. Um, but the other piece of that was the students had a council where they decided, um, they, they created a, a catalog of their experiences. And so I was one of the students selected to work on the catalog that year. That's me like second from the left a long time ago. And one of the things that I, that really just was so fantastic for me was we got to interview two professionals. We interviewed um, a curator and we interviewed a printmaker. And I got to go to the home of James Wells who was a Harlem Renaissance um, printmaker who taught at, at uh, Howard. He was probably one of the first art teachers hired at Howard. And you know he was a, a, an older gentleman then, but as we're talking to him about his career as a printmaker, he says, well, wait, let me show you some things. And he pulls out this big wooden box and inside are all these wood blocks from his time a, as an artist. And so for me, that was kind of life-changing to, to talk to him about his work and to learn what it meant to be a printmaker. So needless to say, I fell in love with the process and the program, and I decided this is something I really want to do. As um, the program for my cycle ended, they have a big exhibition in the museum, and one of the print that I made sold. So I, that was it for me. I'm not going to be a printmaker. That's it. Mm -hmm. So I do wind up going on to study art in undergraduate school, and then I go back to Howard and uh, work on an MFA in printmaking. And to this day, um, I continue to be a printmaker, continue my practice. Um, so that was for the first 10 years or so of the program. So then I wanted to know, well, what happened when Teresa left? Part of what happened was, and this is something to really think about, the Smithsonian's are national museums with their house right here in our hometown in Washington, DC. And we do have a lot of museums here. But when Director Taylor suddenly died and they then had an interim person, the person who came in to replace him said, hey, you know, this is a national museum. These are great programs, but how does this benefit somebody in Tacoma, Washington? You know, um, why are we doing all this for these students in the, the DMV area? So needless to say, the program kind of just died. He, he got rid of it. I'm also not certain he was very fond of having a professional printmaking studio in a museum, <laughs> maybe not too far from works, right? So that might've been something that he didn't particularly care for. So, but the program was so popular that they tried to think of a different way to keep it going. So it got shifted to the Smithsonian Associates on the mall. And so uh, while it was there, um, Skip Barnhart, actually was the last person to work at the program. And he took it from like 1983 to 1996, I believe. And so again, what happened is it's kind of hard to keep a program like that going with no funds. And Teresa and director Taylor had the, the uh, funding for it built into the budget of the museum. And so when that, when that director passed on and a new director came in and dismantled it, and then it went to Smithsonian Associates. They had to find grants to run the program. I think Heckinger Company gave some grant money, but it wasn't something that they could sustain. So unfortunately, the program is no more, but um, I would just love as a person who teaches people to be art teachers now and has worked in places like um, 
had worked into Corcoran for a while where they had a museum and a college. I think it is possible to find ways to do these sorts of programs because they're so transformative for young people, particularly for things like printmaking um, that they wouldn't be able to get in their, their high school program. So um, that's kind of my presentation. And I, these are references, but I want to kind of end with this image so that's one of my prints that I just made like a year ago. And um, that's a QR code to the, the article about this research. Um, and I think there's also the article for the poster presentation I'm doing directly after this about the beginnings of art education for black students in DC. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists. I now want to open the floor for some questions. So if you have a question, uh, let us know. I'll repeat it so that they, they can hear it on the live stream as well. All right. Yes. Uh, right behind you, but then I'll do you next. OK. <laughs> Hmm. Well, I would say this came up about before GoGo. -Go. Um, so this this actually started in 1971. I don't think GoGo -Go was around in 1971. 76-ish. Okay, so close. Uh, so there was some overlap then. Um, I don't know. Maybe Teresa can answer that question better. I remember Greg Tate coming to the gallery, who was, we missed so much. Um, and a number of students did go on, but in terms of, and of doing the posters for Gogo, I don't know, because they're great, yeah. It's hard to say. I can say about some of those posters, I think Globe print, printed a lot of those. And that Micah, where I work now, kind of owns Globe. So it's, it's now part of the Micah um, College's uh, holdings. And the person who was behind that is teaching letterpress at Micah. So that's still going on. But those, those Day Glow posters that were everywhere um, all over the city about the go-go bands and other bands. Um, I'm not certain, but I think Washington, uh, the Washington Printmaking Club is one that was really kind of big behind this. It was a big push behind it. And at that time, um, oh gosh, my, my art names are, are forgetting my art names. Famous black artist here in DC that does the drape paintings. Gilliam. Sam Gilliam. Sam Gilliam was an art teacher here at the time that this was happening. He was at McKinley. And I think he was also must have been connected with taught printmaking, but mostly like with linoleum. And he was saying it's a shame that the students only have that to work with. Mm -hmm. So there were some very powerful people behind having printmaking put into the, into the classrooms here. Yes, yes, Percy Martin, quite a few of the, the local artists here. Yeah. Yeah, he is. It would be interesting to interview them, to ask them, like I'm just talking about how it was transformative for me, but I'm certain like, so some of the stuff that I was able to look at in the Smithsonian archives before they closed everything down, there was one young woman, and I'm sorry, I can't remember everyone's names, but she said, because Teresa went back, I think after 10 years to kind of ask people how it might have impacted them. So there was assessment going on, right? Like, how did this program impact you? Some of them went on to be art majors, some didn't. But this one particular woman wrote back and said, I hope that one day my works will be in the Smithsonian. I am I'm a, an art student now. And she does have a piece of the Smithsonian because I looked it up. Um, so yeah, it's really, it's interesting. I think, it, you know, that was very transformative for a lot of people, but we just don't know all those stories to ask them. 
And I think I would like to know, because I think the museum collected the prints. So when you were in the program, you had to leave a print with the museum. I would love to know where all those are. <laughs> you know, what happened to those? Um, Dr. Lawton, thank you so much for your presentation. Um, I also worked in museum art education for some time at the Hirshhorn, and it was a very locally focused program, but always felt the tensions between the local com commitment to the local youth and national commitment. So I'm wondering if you could speak more to the sort of the tensions that museum education or art education in museums in particular have to these multiple audiences? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think it's, it's pretty difficult. I, I, get, I get the reason why uh, the director did not want to do all these local programs, right? But when you're from the city and have gone to those schools and you know that there's not that many, I mean, there was the Corcoran, there was the Phillips. Um, I'm not sure if they would have had, I mean, the Corcoran probably could have had the resources to do this because it was a college and a museum. But, you know, trying to get college professors to also do something like this on top of their job, it was, it was really difficult. And that was part of the tension for the program between FCC, for example, and the museum. That there was some tension there. Um, I think at this point, museums are really, conscious and interested in trying to reach particularly uh, marginalized or what I would say untapped potential, because I don't like to use the term marginalized when I speak of BIPOC people. Um, but I think that they realize that they have a responsibility in a sense, if they want to keep viewers coming in and you know diversify, truly diversify to, to do what they can with schools and communities. Um, I often feel like museum educators are not as respected as the curators, for example. I think that's a huge story. I mean, I have a lot of students who have gone on to be museum educators and they tell me this all the time. And so it's a big struggle um, to try to get programming in. I, I don't, I'm not sure what the answer is, but maybe a partnership with universities, museums and schools might help, you know, looking at all those resources that they can bring to the, to the mix. I, I, At that time, Dylan Ripley felt that programs that we did, and Dr. Taylor, who was the director, should be national models. <coughs> that if we did this program, then we should promote it, and we tried, but that was very difficult. It was a, in retrospect, when I joined the staff, and I had been a DC teacher, they said, we want you to get the DC schools to pay for this. And I taught in high school for three years and had no yellow paint and paper. My mother was an art teacher, but she said we were very expensive. So I just said, this is a Smithsonian institution. You're going to pay for it. That was one of the big things that, you know, this whole idea, like the National Gallery says, you know, we're as a nation and they're doing it all over the national but it never develops. Time for oh, just one more question. I do encourage you guys to come up and talk to our panelists afterwards. I'm sorry, we was, ran out of time. Was Lou Stovall involved in the program that you, you were? Know, I don't think he was, but I will say that he opened his house for me all the time when I brought my students from the Corcoran to his home so they could talk to a printmaker. Yeah, so. Thank you so much, everyone. And I... <laughs> invite you to come talk to our panelists.